the world looks to California to answer the hard questions for redemption, to introduce the unfamiliar, to be resilient. Because California bounces back, holds us accountable, values who we are, remains vigilant, defies those in our way, and stands for community. Here on the West Coast, we're at the center of it all. Los Angeles Times, the state of what's next.
Good evening. I'm Matt Brennan, television editor of the Los Angeles Times. Welcome to We Can Teach You That, the virtual series hosted by the Los Angeles Times. We're excited to offer practical classes taught by Times writers, editors, photographers, and others, where readers can explore new subjects and longtime interests from the comfort of our, from their own home uh, with Times experts as their guides. I've been the Times television editor since 2019. And before that, I worked as Pace Magazine's television editor. I was born in Boston, educated at USC, and lived in New Orleans before coming back to LA. Tonight, I'll be joining my colleagues on the TV team to talk about what we're watching right now, how we do our jobs, and what you can learn from people who watch television for a living. A quick tech note before we get started. If you've signed up for this We Can Teach You That webinar, you can participate in polls this evening and share your questions in the questions module. We'll do a Q&A at the end of the discussion. If you're watching a live stream, you can view this discussion but won't be able to participate directly. One year into the pandemic, TV isn't just the center of our living rooms, it's the center of our cultural lives. And that's why it's so exciting to talk about, especially with a team whose tastes vary as widely as ours. Uh, I'd like to introduce our guest this evening. Lorraine Ali is a TV critic who was previously the paper's music editor and senior writer in the calendar section, where she covered culture at large and American Muslim issues. Robert Lloyd has been a Times television critic since 2003. Previously, he held that position at LA Weekly, where he also worked as music editor and critic. Tracy Brown is a reporter who divides her time between covering breaking entertainment news, pop culture, and television. And Greg Braxton is a lifelong LA resident who has written for the Times for more than three decades. He currently covers TV. Thank you, Lorraine, Robert, Tracy, and Greg for joining me. Uh, in a moment, we'll start our conversation, but we're gonna kick it off with our first poll question. How has the pandemic changed your TV viewing habits? My viewing is unchanged from a year ago. I watch the same amount of TV, but my tastes have changed. I watch more TV, but my tastes are the same. I watch more TV and my tastes have changed. I watch less TV than ever. Uh, while everyone is responding, I can definitely tell you that I don't watch less TV than ever. <laughs> um, and my own viewing has tended to match the phases of the pandemic. So in lockdown at the beginning, I went for historical dramas like uh, Jane Austen adaptations and Wolf Hall. During the summer when I could get outdoors more and was going to the beach, I was reading and not watching as much TV, which was nice. Then when the fall surge hit and campaign season started, other than watching the conventions and the debates, I spent a lot of time eating pizza and drinking wine in bed while binging television. Um, and then lately I'm on a reality kick. I, uh, I wonder, you know, Robert, you've been a critic for um, approaching 20 years at the Times. Has the pandemic kind of changed your approach to how you watch TV compared to the usual just sort of onslaught of TV that a critic has to pay attention to? Not really. Um, partly because uh, over my TV writing career, I've worked from home. Um, so the fact that we're stuck at home hasn't really changed anything. And... Um, so much of what we do, so much of the watching we do is geared to um, the things we have to watch. And there's there's always that. TV didn't really slow down that much during the pandemic. There was still a lot coming. Um, whether old things or things that were being imported, there was always things to watch. Um, so e even finding time for personal viewing is a, is a trick. Um, so I don't really think so. I think um, I think I might have been just from from having worked at home so long. I might have been unusually prepared for psychologically prepared for a time of isolation. Um, so it didn't really feel like I make up anything uh, psychologically with it. So I'd say no, it hasn't changed. Well, let's uh, check out the results of our first poll and see what uh, our viewers had to say. Okay, so we have a pretty clear majority of folks watching more TV, but they're evenly split between their tastes have changed and their tastes are the same. 
that's really that's really fascinating. So my kind of working theory, um, while we've been talking about the pandemic really throughout, when we started doing guides about what to watch in quarantine, is that when people are binging for comfort, they tend to go toward what they kind of love the most, which is how I ended up with historical dramas at the beginning of the pandemic. But some of the things more recently that I've loved uh, were Ted Lasso, which was uh, Apple TV Plus's half hour comedy starring Jason Sudeikis as an American football coach who starts managing an English soccer club and ends up teaching a lot of lessons along the way. That was really comforting during the fall. Um, I loved the Kaylee Cuoco HBO Max comedy, The Flight Attendant, which mixed um, a murder mystery and some really serious themes about addiction and substance abuse with a kind of frothy caper comedy. And um, Netflix is The Queen's Gambit, um, which stars Anya Taylor-Joy as a chess prodigy uh, in uh, mid-century um, United States and kind of a globe-trotting Cold War sports drama. Um, all of those were things that I really sort of have glommed onto as a way of, I don't know, taking a break from the news, which has also really dominated television for so much of the past year. Um, Lorraine, I would love to hear about what you watch for comfort. Well, certainly not the news for comfort. Um, I do watch that to cover it, and then I need the comfort TV after I've watched the news. Um, initially, for comfort, I think because I was just so pissed off, I started watching Sons of Anarchy. It was familiar, but it's about a biker gang. They're pissed off. I was pissed off. It just worked. Um, then I kind of needed something that was topical but funnier, so I went into Blackish because all seven seasons had dropped on Hulu. So that was great to go through. But then I started like going towards some shows that I had liked on their first season came back this year, which were Rami, uh, The Boys, The Umbrella Academy, all very, well, Umbrella Academy and The Boys were kind of like farcical things on superheroes, which I really liked. Rami is just, I can't say a lot of what Rami is on here because there's words I can't use while we're live on whatever this is. I know it's not Zoom. But Rami's great, um, Muslim American sitcom on Hulu. But then as things like rolled on, I felt like, okay, I do need to do some escaping here. Well, first I kind of wanted to travel and I started looking at, I found two really kind of obscure things from Egypt. Um, one of them is paranormal and it is a kind of supernatural dark comedy and it's made in Egypt. It's one of Netflix only things that was made in Egypt so far. And it kind of bases its stories on this um, regional lore, like real regional lore, like mummies, um, all sorts of different like curses and things like that. But it's brilliant. It's so good. And then I found a documentary called, I'm going to have to look up, um, Secrets of the Sacra Tomb. And it's about these guys who just go and excavate in these sand dunes in Egypt and they find this like amazing tombs. And somehow I felt like, okay, this is getting me out of my house. Then I was done thinking I wanted to escape. I went to Bridgerton, Netflix, uh, and that is a Regency era, what would you say, kind of like romance. It's fun, but it's viewed through like a modern lens, so there's a lot of hooking up, and it's a Shonda Rhimes production. Then I just didn't want to think at all, and I just watched two seasons of Blown Away, which is really watching people blow glass on... <laughs> Netflix, reality competition, blowing glass. I'm like I'm like, this is my speed right now, just watching people blow glass. So yes, that, that's been my crazy arc. But to, to get back to something Robert said, he said TV didn't slow down. Oh my God, no, it didn't. It felt like it was still a landslide of stuff on top of needing comfort from old stuff. So I feel like I've watched more than ever. Right, and it really hasn't slowed down even recently, you know? I just feel like everything gets filtered through the lens of television, uh, and we're going to talk about some of that tonight. Um, but before we do, uh, Tracy, I would love to hear what you have been binging for comfort in the pandemic. 
Um, I think like a lot of people, I went through phases too. So very early on was definitely like, I did not want to watch things with people in it, like real live action people. So I watched a whole bunch of cartoons, cartoons that um, I'd seen already, cartoons that were just coming out. So everything from uh, like She-Ra and People in the Age of the Wonder Beast, which is like post-apocalyptic um, and things like that. But when I finally got to a place where I was willing to um, invest in people's and their actual lives, less fantasy again, um, I rediscovered the joy of half hour shows, like half hour, like more comedy oriented shows like that. Um, and I visited um, and I went to watch shows that were new to me at least. So um, I think the first one I really like upset, like I watched in less than a day probably was uh, Never Have I Ever on Netflix, which is um, right. Uh, coming of age show, Indian American high school student who's overcoming grief and also having to deal with just everything that comes with being a high school kid in LA. Um, and then I also, uh, more recently, I've, uh, I started watching Dickinson on Apple TV plus, which, um, is a look at like our Victorian poet, but through a very like 21st century lens, um so it, it tackles issues about like gender and it's partly inspired by her real life but a lot of it is obviously embellished and imaginary but it, it, it's it's fun it, like fun is what i want during this time uh greg what have you been uh digging into during the pandemic it's it's weird because um having worked in the office all the time during the day, um, I wouldn't automatically turn on TV. At, I, I could only watch TV at night, and sometimes it was just the stuff that I had to cover. But one of the things that I did catch up on um, a few weeks after everyone else, but I binged The Mandalorian. Um, I'm not a big Star Wars person, but I found that the Mandalorian really was just sort of a takeoff of, of a Western and used all these Western tropes while combining it with the Star Wars universe. And I found that, you know, just one evening uh, with a Star Wars friend of mine, we just watched the whole thing. It was like this 10 hour movie that we just enjoyed. Um, and it really worked. It was like a, a, a Star Wars marathon. The other uh, because I work so much in television, I feel like I always get behind, and I was behind on Homeland uh, at least the last several seasons. So I finally caught up on like the last three seasons and found myself staying up really late at night because it was like one of those situations of just one more, just one more. How could I miss this show while it was on? Um, and I just really got uh, captivated by it. I thought the performances and the story, and and I'm just sorry I missed it when it was on, but it really kind of uh, helped me through. And you know, when I needed something that was just real escapist, but also very political and very relevant to our world and some of the political traumas that we're living through. And Robert, I know that you sort of kicked this conversation off by saying that you were sort of relatively well equipped because of your experience to weather the pandemic in a TV viewing sense. But was there anything that you sort of uh, either discovered or rediscovered during the pandemic as a viewer? Uh, yeah, I um, went to, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, just like everybody else in the world, a lot of television viewing these days consists of whatever your streamer is you're looking through you're clicking down rows you're clicking across you're thinking is this me am i going to invest in this um and knowing a little bit about myself uh and what we watch here uh my wife and i and what we uh agree on um i gave a world to new tricks which is on um there it is um and uh, it streams on Britbox partly and also on Hulu. 
Um, and that is a British uh, crime show from, it ran from 2003 to 2015. When you're picking something to binge, it's good to pick something that's been, has, has a lot of episodes. So this qualifies. And um, it's, uh, it's a non-gritty uh, crime, which is, uh, you know, I'm not, uh, words like dark and gritty are things that I'm going to avoid uh, if I can. Uh, they're going to send me the other way. Um, so the, 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 it's a cold case show. Three of the detectives are ex policemen and have been brought back to, uh, into this new unit to solve old cases. And uh, the three old guys are the, the ex cops and the younger woman is the, is a current cop. And, um, the, it's very character driven in terms of the, the, the officers. So you, you watch it for them and, and the cases are sort of there as an excuse to watch their interaction. And they're all quirky and strange. And even though the cast changed a little bit over the years, it, it kind of, it always worked with whoever else they brought in. And we just finished that. So there's a big hanging question on uh, what we'll watch next. Um, other things that uh, I uh, watched during the pandemic are Call My Agent, which is a French a series that's on Netflix and that's set in a, uh, um, a French theatrical agency uh, for actors, um, movie actors and TV actors. And it's a, a lovely, also character driven um, a series which features uh, famous French stars as themselves. And um, Oh, oh, just the interaction in, um, in the offices, uh, I guess, where none of us are in offices. It's sort of, uh, it's very satisfying. It's very, uh, it's not quite soap opery. It's a little too realistic for that. Um, and then um, I also caught up on Dickinson. I made way through that and I quite love that. Um, and then um, I started watching, uh, sort of catching up with the Star Trek uh, Discovery which is on um, uh, what's now called Paramount and was previously CBS All Access. And that is a show, uh, one of this growing franchise, a still growing franchise of Star Trek shows. Um, and what's great about that, the first season is a little hard going. It's set, it's, half of it seems to be spoken in Klingon the first season, and it's, it's fairly dark and more violent. But it's gotten to a place where now where it's, it's very much in the old spirit of Star Trek of uh, um, kind of, uh, you know, that old exploratory and uh, episodic. It's not exactly episodic. There are, there are um, longer arcs, but it, it has a kind of optimism that's built into the series. It's a, it's very, um, you know, it's multi-species, uh, not only multi-ethnic, but multi-species, multicultural, multi-planetary. Um, and uh, it's very emotional. I've never seen a show in which so many people have tears in their eyes so much of the time. Um, but it, it, it's hopeful, and, uh, and this season especially has, has kind of taken off uh, in the right direction. The last season included uh, a young Spock and Star Trek fans will remember uh, Captain Christopher Pike is a character in that year. But this year, they've moved into the future, and there's a kind of a uh, hand soloish uh, character who works very well with the lead. And anyway, it's it's, it's good. Um, I would love to hear what our viewers uh, are watching for comfort. So I'm going to um, go to our second poll question. Um, so the question is, what is your idea of comfort TV? We have a bunch of options by genre, sports, sitcoms, period dramas, mysteries and or true crime, reality TV, rewatching old favorites, uh, movies, uh, and none of the above. And it's, it's funny, um, while folks are responding to the poll, you know, it, part of what we've been talking about is that what we go for with comfort is a kind of tone 
you know, like Robert, you you talking about Star Trek Discovery um, as being emotional, kind of connected with why I loved Ted Lasso, which is like right on the borderline between being too sappy, but it, like it was just sappy enough for me in this past year. I feel like the the pandemic mm-hmm. has erased a little bit of my TV cynicism. I don't know if um, if any of you have felt like you have softened up a little bit during the pandemic. Greg, Greg, is there anything that you would have not gone for that you've kind of gotten into in the last 12 months? Probably stuff uh, that that is so weird and so bizarre and off the beaten track for some reason the other night uh i flipped by this show called my 600 pound life uh which is a reality show about a a very heavy woman who is struggling uh to get her life back together and that's something that uh normally i would have just kept going by but then i just kept getting deeper and deeper into it because it was so distant from my own life and i was just wondering you know about the the nature of the series and the personalities and um it's 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 sort of it, it was just weird it's just nothing i would have ever gravitated towards before but i find myself being more open to the things that are sort of really out of my area of interest um but that's that's the main one I, it's it was just kind of a bizarre experience to just sit there and be drawn in um let's take a look at what our viewers said okay okay true crime i feel like lorraine you, I would love to talk to you about your true crime sort of obsession, since that seems to be leading among um, among our viewers tonight. You have written a couple of really smart pieces recently about LA true crime, and I know that you're kind of a true crime buff in general. Can you talk to us about some of your likes and dislikes in that uh, genre and what appeals to you about it in general? Well, first, I just want to say I'm so excited that I'm not alone in, like, <laughs> my sick addiction to true crime. It's not sick anymore. We're all in this together. Um, I, I have to say, okay, so there's different areas of true crime that I have gone towards. Like, the first 48, I can binge that on Amazon all the time. That was an a and series. I love that series. But then there's the kind of, like, higher-end true crime, which is, like, things on HBO, like Murder on Middle Beach, or I don't know if you call it the Vow True Crime, which is, you know, about the Nexium cult, but it did lead to the leader of the Nexium cult, or at least, I don't know if it led to it, but he got arrested towards the end of it, so that was really fascinating. But I really loved um, the Night Stalker uh, um, documentary, docuseries on Netflix for various reasons. Um, is it disturbing? Totally. But then it was also like a slice of LA back in the 80s. And I'm an, an, a native. I'm from here, which is also, Tracy, why I love Never Have I Ever, because it is in LA and it's about an immigrant kid. But anyway, I digress. I love The Night Stalker for that because it brought you back to that time. What is it that I like about true crime? I think it's the idea that there's a way, like, Horrible things happen, but generally these shows are about solving those crimes, are about, you know, catching who did it. And somehow it feels like there's justice. Like, look, there's justice in the world. You know, not all of them, but in in a time when everything seems like kind of loose-ended and when you just feel like God, people are getting away with so much here and there. I know it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but in true crime, they catch them. And it could be from one carpet fiber in the back of a crazy, ugly van, and they catch them. So there's just something about that. You, there's a pattern, and you kind of know it's going to happen, but then, you know, 
the newer kind of more high-end ones mix it up a little. But yeah, I, I love my true crime, I have to say. And I'm so glad that other people out there do too. I'm not alone. See, TV team, there's other people. While we're on the subject of LA, I would be remiss if I didn't ask Tracy to talk about a new show that you introduced me to um, and recently wrote about for the Times. Um, could you tell us a little bit about City of Ghosts and what it is and why people might be into it? Sure. Um, I think as, as uh, feeding up Lorraine, like this is also, it's, it's an LA show, um, City of Ghosts. It landed on my radar because the showrunner, Elizabeth Ito, worked on a, a Adventure Time and she had a short out called, uh, I don't know, I'm missing it. Um, she had a short that I saw, saw on the internet once, but it's a, it's just, it's a documentary series-ish animated show and it's very cute and it's gentle and it's a kid-friendly love letter to Los Angeles basically and all the different uh, our diversity, diverse communities and our neighborhoods and our history. Um, and the kids go and interview ghosts about at different places about like why they're there and they learn about different communities from like Boyle Heights, Koreatown, Limerick Park. And um, the animation style, they it, they basically drew on top of photos, sort of. So they're flashes of places. Um, I'm also an LA native. So there were a lot of places that I haven't been able to go to during the pandemic because we're just kind of stuck at home that were familiar that I was like, there were like street corners I recognized in the show and like that was fun. So just anything that's like, look how great LA is. Um, I don't know. We just hit the right chord for for me at the time. Right now, you should all go watch it right now on Netflix. I agree. That is a that's the best show I've seen about Los Angeles ever, probably. And wow. uh, places that I it's it just catches different places and, and and it catches the light, it catches the feel. And what's great about it uh, is that it's multi generational because a lot of the ghosts who are actually not dead people, they're living people that were obviously interviewed and then animated. Um, but like for the Atomic Cafe episode that um, focuses on a, on a no longer extant cafe in uh, Japantown, little Tokyo, um, where I used to spend a lot of time um, after shows in Chinatown. Um, and, uh, and the woman who's the ghost in there is someone that I remember well from, from the restaurant. Um, but it's it goes everywhere, and it just it's honest and it's right. I just have never seen anything that doesn't involve a negative look at like crime, like you know, a show like The Closer, which covered a lot of LA, but in a negative light. Um, anyway, I really love it. Yeah, I think there's something. Insecure is a great show for LA too. Uh, Lorraine, I remember I was just about to bring that up because I remember at the very beginning of lockdown is when the most recent season of Insecure premiered. And you wrote a piece about how it was kind of like an escape into the city that we missed at the time. And I just think that that show has become richer with every season. And it's, as Robert was saying, it's the geography of LA feels so much more kind of in love with the city than um, than sort of only focusing on its flaws, but it also doesn't ignore its flaws, which I, I think is kind of the experience of living in a city as big and multifaceted as LA, is like you're in love with parts of it and there are other parts of it that frustrate you. Yeah, it know because it knows the city, right? I mean, it's, it's it feels on an authentic love hate living here in the city with the traffic with the good food hanging out with your friends knowing what parts knowing like where the club with the kind of people that you wouldn't hang out with are I mean it's just it's got everything in it and you just know it knows LA and that's why especially at the beginning of the pandemic when it's like wait a minute we can't leave and it's like that let me leave that let me go around my city. And it was, that to me was like incredibly, I don't liberating in a way. For sure. 
Um, I know that our viewers didn't rate it as highly on their viewing lists, but I would be remiss if we didn't talk about reality TV because it's all that I'm watching lately. I think I think at some point the pandemic just sort of broke my brain. So um, two of our team members who are not with us tonight, uh, Yvonne Villarreal and Meredith Blake, um, are big fans of The Real Housewives. And they had been nudging me basically since I started the job to, to watch it. And I started... Um, binging old seasons on Hulu and I'm currently binging the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills and I can't stop and I'm also binging um I watched all of the real world New York because Paramount Plus has a reunion special going um where the original cast members have gotten back together 30 years later and it's fascinating um and it's amazing uh Meredith wrote a story about one of the cast members who became embroiled in a racism controversy. And that season was shot during the LA riots in 1992. And the conversations that they're having about race in 1992 are so familiar to the ones that we're having as a culture right now. Um, and it just draws you in immediately. Um, and then there's, Another reality franchise, Greg, that has found itself embroiled in a racism controversy this season, and you've covered it extensively. Um, can you talk about sort of, you know, how The Bachelor got to the place that it is right now, and also what you made of last night's special? Because I thought the piece that you wrote on it was a really strong take. The, the Bachelor is is nothing I would ever admit to watching in my my prior life, probably because it had nothing to do with me, and I was sort of offended by the fact that this franchise, the whole franchise, seemed to be so overwhelmingly white and just dismissive of other cultures. But uh, they have tried to reverse themselves and start to feature uh, black bachelor and bachelorettes as leads, um, which is a very interesting twist. However, the problems that have developed on the show is that the producers and the people who put it on haven't really been equipped to figure out how to really honor people of culture or deal with that dynamic and it's resulted in a lot of problems the latest season just featured the first black bachelor the show has been on for 18 years it's had like 40 seasons and we're just now getting to the love story that features a black guy searching for love um and it was handled so badly, partly because um, the producers cast a woman who has a history of doing racially insensitive things in her past, uh, attending antebellum balls and liking pictures that were racially insensitive. And wouldn't you know it, the Black Bachelor bypassed all these other women of color and fell for the woman that had the racist past. He didn't know that she had all this offensive behavior in the past. And it just really, not only did that turn out very badly, but um, the show tried to keep to its formula of really just kind of ignoring cultural differences or the unique things about different cultures that really would have, I think, elevated the show and made it a lot more interesting um, and just still put the focus on white people. So I think it's, it's, become in, it's become a real problem for this franchise. And I think it's, it hasn't changed with the times. It hasn't recognized how we're living in 2021 and in the age of Black Lives Matter and, and greater racial sensitivity, 
Um, but the bachelor is still mired in 1980 or 1990, whenever it started. Um, and so it's, it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating examination. Um, and fans of the show, it, it's, it's also, um, expose this kind of ugly, ugly underbelly of the fan base where there are fans who are resistant to change and fans who want to, uh, the show to really change. Uh, there was a big controversy with the host of the show who really um, had to say some really racially insensitive things. Uh, it's just exploded all over the place. And so the show is, it's, it's trying to maintain the fairy tale formula, but it's, it's, uh, it's insistence on doing that is causing some real, real problems. One of the things that you and I sort of talked about while working on your piece about the finale, which aired last night, um, and for the viewers out there, the way The Bachelor works is they tape the season well in advance, and that includes everything from sort of meeting the contestants all the way through to offering the final rose, which is sort of a promise of a relationship. But then after the season has aired is when they tape something called the After the Final Rose special. And in last night's special you know, Greg and I are sort of talking about it while it's airing and he's preparing to write his story about it. And Greg, one of the things that you said to me that there was a moment in the special where Matt James, The Bachelor, is asked, um, R Rachel Kirkconnell, the, the woman that he had originally sort of pledged to be in a relationship with, apologizes to him and the the sort of host Emmanuel Acho kind of prompts him for a response and there was the longest silence that I can remember hearing on a broadcast television um episode in a while and what you said that was really kind of smart last night was you know Matt kind of broke from the bachelor's traditional script and I think that that we'll talk about the we're going to talk about the Royals uh, interview in a little bit. But those moments when things sort of depart from expectation or depart from convention are a lot of why reality TV, even though it's so trashy sometimes, ends up often kind of breaking through in this way because you can't plan for everything like you can on a yeah, and, show. And and during the during the filming of The Bachelor, of course, so many of the, the events and so many of the relationships and so many of the interactions that you see are manipulated or edited in a way that don't really, re might not really reflect what really happened. So last night during the show, when Matt James is really having to deal with the reality of not only what happened with the season and how he probably felt betrayed by the producers, but also having to sit by this woman that he fell deeply in love with, but had to split from because she had real no real understanding of racial awareness of, of, of what it meant to be a Black man. It, it just seems like it was the first time that they really had to deal with race and he found himself almost unable to speak. It was like the gravity of the situation was so mammoth for him. And it was a combination of pain. He felt anger. He felt so much. Uh, and I think when we feel a lot of that, sometimes we're, we're just, we can't speak. Or if we speak, we're going to say something that we may regret. And you saw that played out in real time last night. It was just really gripping television that I think a lot of people felt Matt's silence said more than anything that was spoken or said or presented during the entire season. It was, it was, a, it was a fascinating thing to see. 
Um, I want to move on to talk about a couple other beloved genres, uh, sitcoms and superheroes. Uh, Tracy, you uh, covered WandaVision like a champ, and it was probably the most talked about TV show of the year so far. Um, I was wondering if you could sort of talk our viewers who may not be familiar through one, sort of what WandaVision is, and two, how we approached our coverage with the weekly stories that you did. Uh, sure. Um, so WandaVision is uh, Marvel Studios' first television series that they debuted on Disney Plus, and it, you know, and it came out in, after a year of not having any superhero temple movies and stuff like that. So it was obviously highly anticipated by fans. Um, but instead of what you would expect from a superhero show, it was it was the weekly rollout. Let it. It was an homage to sitcoms basically every week it was a different decade of sitcoms and then the the neighborhood that um wanda and vision lived in would would transport to like the 50s the 60s and would play with tropes that we we're really familiar with um, while also basically looking at wanda's life after the massive events that happen in these temple like like the battles that you have to have have in superhero movies and just like what it what she's going through her grief her recovery all of that um so our approach in coverage um i think is this is a show that came after over 10 years of movies and backstory um about two characters that have been around for decades in comic books and it's the first time they're getting the spotlight like we they've been around the people who only know Marvel movies don't really know a lot about them. Um, so, the explainers, <laughs> my explainers were like a like a a look by, a between it kind of bridged the gaps. It was picking up on the clues that they gave us that you might know if you had watched the MCU movies, if you watched some of the bigger, or if you read some of the some of the comic book runs, but not without getting too into the weeds, <laughs> into small details. <laughs> Because it could have, you know, just to add, it's like a cheat. It was like a cheat sheet. It's like this is what happened that you may not have noticed or you may not have missed if you hadn't watched, you know, 20, 40 hours of movies in the past. <laughs> um, I have to say that they were my cheat sheet. I, our measure for what should be an explainer was often like what confused Matt about this episode, <laughs> which is how I approach most of my editing is like, what do I not know? And then I tell someone else to explain it to me. Um, Robert and Lorraine, you both also wrote about it, but I know that you're not as sort of embedded in the MCU as Tracy is. I was wondering if each of you could talk about why it appealed to you as, as folks who are maybe not Marvel or comic book uh, diehards and forgive me if I have somehow missed that you are. Um, you're Lorraine, more, you you're wrote. More DC, aren't you, Lorraine? You're more DC, aren't you, Lorraine? Uh, yeah, totally. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, Robert, do you want? Would you like to go first since I'm more D DC? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> I like I like the um, the sitcom element to it. Um, when I reviewed it, it was um, it had only been on for they sent three episodes to review, so I, I was going off the three episodes in which the bigger framework of the series, which not to get spoilery, um, but there's a world outside of the sitcom world that's looking in on this world. Um, so it, I was reviewing it almost as a kind of a commentary on on television, um, and they were very smart. Uh, the first, the first episode is Dick Van Dyke. The second episode is Bewitched, and the third episode is The Brady Bunch as the main reference. And the the sets are recall the sets of those shows without actually replicating them. But there's enough that you 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 know where you are. Um, and uh, the first one was in black and white, and I believe it was filmed with a live audience. The second is uh, the Bewitched episode changes as the series does from of black and white to color, um, and that was all. That was all very clever. I understood 
not a lot of the Marvel references, but you understand when something is a reference, even if you don't quite get the reference. Um, and uh, I, what I liked about it was that, as opposed to superhero movies, um, you got, which are mostly uh, fights with banter in between, you got characters that were interacting, even though they were interacting through this, um, uh, this filter of a uh, television show, they were emotional uh, moments and it was long. It gave two characters uh, different ways to deal with each other in a way that was on its own was quite rewarding. Uh, so I enjoyed that aspect of it. Uh, and the rest of it, it, it I thought was good um, when they bring it out to the more kind of traditional Marvel uh, scape. Uh, and also because there was just more time, there's more time in a series for characters to act like people, even if they're superheroes. Well, you know what, I I think what, part of what you just said, like, what was so brilliant about WandaVision is, like, okay, for people like me that don't know the Marvel Universe, the whole idea of, like, the history of television and this throwback, you know, to kind of emulating these old shows sucked me in, because it was just so unique. Um but then I have a 17-year-old son, and he was sitting there explaining to me all this Marvel stuff as it's going along. I'm like, yeah, yeah, okay, you know, sure, go ahead, explain it. But then it's both of them started to merge. And I thought it was like so brilliant how they didn't just aim it at people who knew, already knew the backstory. But thank God for Tracy's explainers for those of us that didn't. But then they also, you know, opened it up to, um, but they also put enough in there for people that were Marvel fans to, you know, suck everybody in. But then also there was this emotional component in there about grief that was just, I don't know that I've seen anything that's kind of been a, you know, based on these universes where I'm watching it and I'm like in tears. I know many films have made people cry, but not me. But Marvel Vision, I mean, <laughs> Sorry, WandaVision did that. I mean, it's it's commentary on grief was kind of amazing. Um, so yeah, it was, and you could say like also Mandalorian in terms of just something to watch with my son that I could get into and that he knew the backstory to. I think we're kind of seeing more and more of that as this stuff is going into series. And I think that's a smart way to do it. You're reaching a lot of people. Yeah, I think what's really been the most um kind of brilliant gambit of the of the flagship Disney Plus shows so far the Mandalorian and WandaVision is that they really are designed to balance the demands of people who are very invested in those worlds and in expanding those worlds and also making them legible to people like me who aren't necessarily clued in but they're still watchable you know and they still make you invested in them um, and I think that's just such a smart um, that's just such a smart lesson that all sort of TV shows could could benefit from, especially those that are connected to franchises, is you have to have an opening to someone who's not already part of that world if you're going to win over new audiences. And I think that that the kind of conversation that emerged around WandaVision where everyone was clamoring every week to for the net for the new episode. Is kind of speaks to how well that worked. Yeah. yeah well, if you put a little, little baby Yoda in this show, that's going to get people. I don't know what the Mandalorian is going to do without baby Yoda, but I'm not sure if I'm going to watch it if it doesn't have some kind of <laughs> child Yoda qual quality to it. <laughs> yeah, I Tracy did. I, I think it was, correct me if I'm wrong, Tracy, but didn't you do a whole sort of like list of the things that baby Yoda had eaten. Yes, I All did a baby Yoda food yeah. diary. <laughs> that was it, yes, so brilliant. <laughs> that was, um, <laughs> to give, we're gonna get to kind of a little bit more about how we work, but that was a, a really sort of key example of, um, all of you and the rest of the team know that if you tweet and or slack something offhandedly that I think is a good idea, you are very likely to land yourself an assignment, even if you didn't intend to. And I think that was something where Tracy, you said to me as a kind of a joke, like, wouldn't it be funny if we, if like baby Yoda had a food diary? And I was like, 
you done. You have yourself an assignment. <laughs> Definitely. I was a, um, a stray, like everything Baby Yoda eats slack. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, I promised some, some Royals talk and we're already, um, you know, running a little long and I don't want to take up too much of people's time. Um, but very quickly, Lorraine, I was wondering if you could um, talk about why you found uh, HBO's docuseries about um, the allegations that Woody Allen um, abused daughter Dylan Farrow. Um, the docuseries is called uh, Allen v. Farrow. Allegations, I should say, a front that Allen has repeatedly denied. Um, but there's a new docuseries that's been airing on HBO that ended um, on Sunday night and sort of digs into the case from um, Dylan and mother Mia Farrow's point of view. Could you just sort of briefly give your, you know, gloss on why you think it was so effective yeah um, that's funny I thought you were gonna like ask me about the crown at first I'm like Pat don't ask me about the crown <laughs> um although I'll talk about it anyway um <laughs> Alan versus Sparrow th I think the reason it was so effective is this it, number one the way that they it's an investigative series so you're getting like a kind of they're digging into a lot of things so they're digging into the court cases but they're also looking at family you know, family films that Mia had taken of the children. They're also getting all these firsthand interviews. And then they put it all together and you get this really sort of comprehensive, or it's more like they've built this whole narrative really carefully with all of these different pieces. And okay, so sure, a good documentary should do that. But all these years, it kind of shows you how the main narrative out there has been Woody Allen's narrative. He's had the power, he's had the money, he's had, you know, um, the, essentially everybody behind him, many people behind him. You know, I mean, just look how many Academy Awards he was still winning after, you know, these allegations were coming out, after he married, you know, um, Mia's other daughter, Sonia. So it's, it's really compelling in that way, but also just that you get Dylan's voice as an adult, but then you also see her as a child talking about it on video, which is, almost when I talk about it now, it's really heartbreaking. So it's effective in that way and then it's emotional, but it also builds a really compelling narrative from lots and lots of different pieces. And really, I mean, one thing I'll make this quick, but like, I was really shocked at how much um, blowback I got from Alan fans for just even liking the documentary. And I wrote a second piece about like, what is this? Why, why all this anger and ire over this? when you look at everything else that's going on in the world. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a talker and people are still talking about it. Well, it's like those, those, even after these allegations came out and even after the, the sort of outrageous uh, thing of marrying his stepdaughter that major stars still continue to, to work with, with Woody Allen, which I found sort of amazing, like, even after he he reached his creative prime, um, that people still wanted to work with Woody, like they they saw him as this creative genius, even though he had this kind of shadow over him. And the documentary also has these phone calls where you hear Woody and Mia talking, and you see another side of you hear another side of Woody Allen, which is really chilling, very cold, very just sort of unfeeling towards. Mia Farrow when she's pleading with him to not drag the children into this this darkness of his and it's 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 just really it, it's it's a really chilling project yeah it sticks with you for sure yeah um in turn I mean I think that that one of the things that we that sort of inspired my kind of selection of topics for tonight was we all know and believe and in fact experience firsthand that television has been kind of the center of the culture for, I mean, not just the pandemic, although I think the pandemic has sort of intensified that, but really over the last several years, it has increasingly been kind of the locus of where the conversation in the culture is happening. 
And a lot of times that can be very fraught and result in blowback or commentary. I mean, I know we all get a, a ton of comments on the stories that we do around these very kind of popular shows like WandaVision and The Bachelor and um, um, and Alan V. Farrow. And I, oh, I wanted to also talk about something um, which was the Oprah's interview with um, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. Um, that was in a lot of ways like continuation of a much longer story that is for close observers of the House of Windsor to, to talk about. But it also in many ways is a TV story. Um, it, for me, it was so effective because it was orchestrated by Oprah in the way that it was. And it just, so many of these TV interviews end up being all hype. And that interview to me was like, I couldn't stop watching it. I wasn't waiting for the commercial breaks. I wasn't waiting for when they would have the big revelation. It was like every segment had information that I didn't know or hadn't heard that I wanted to. And um, I'm curious about, you know, what you all made of both kind of the interview itself, but also of the reaction to it and what it says about the place of TV in our culture right now. Um, I don't know, L Lorraine, do you wanna maybe kick us sure, off? Sure, Yeah, I mean, it's funny because I am um, kind of cynical and cranky when it comes to, you know, this obsession with the Royals, um, especially here in America. I, I, I just, I've made jokes about, you know, the what the royal wedding that I know about is the red wedding from Game of Thrones, but things like that. But I think this moment, I mean, number one, you forget what a great interviewer Oprah is. She is. Um, and she can, you know, there was tons of, you know, criticism of it. Like, well, she wasn't hard enough. She didn't like really drill down, but it's like, no, but she gets people to open up. And I think, you know, that's number one. And the number two, this wasn't just another thing with, oh, there's a royal scandal. This started looking at, or this kind of cracked open this whole thing about race and about all the stuff that we are dealing with outside of Windsor. Um, all of a sudden, it's there. And people are kind of paying even more attention to it. Now, maybe people that wouldn't generally be listening or generally be looking at um, that kind of tougher subject matter right now were because of this interview. So, yeah, I mean, that's kind of my take on it. I know Robert's a huge fan of the Royals too, but. Oh yeah, they're, they're my jam. Totally. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't see it. I, my experience of that interview was completely secondhand through Twitter and the Times coverage of it. Um, so, you know, I'm inclined to, uh, to sympathize with the uh, with the discontents of the royal family, so uh, you know my my uh, sympathies just go naturally toward her, and of course she's a TV star too, so that there's that. Um, but um, you know it's it's not everybody is in on these moments, although they reach you. So it was unavoidable, even if I even if I didn't watch it, uh, there it was everywhere. Well, and yeah, it was I also, was gonna... sorry, I just wanted to say one thing. It was also like this collision of LA with the royal family. It was so many different collisions, America, England, royal family, LA, Hollywood. It was an interesting collision of things. Yeah, I mean, I and, you know, ask... the, crown, the crown has taught us, of course, that there's, there, there's sickness there, so. Um, Robert, did you feel like from not having watched it, but from having sort of, you're on Twitter, you're on social media, you read the Times, did you feel like you got enough of the gist to sort of not have to go back and watch it? Or were you just sort of just uninterested from the get-go? Not uninterested. Sometimes you feel you, you read something and then you want to go find the video of it. Uh, so you, you get the picture of it, but I guess I felt that the information itself was sufficient. I didn't really, I didn't really feel like I lacked the voices um, 
you know, and so it was covered so much. I mean, obviously there are things I didn't see, but the bullet points seem to have been pretty, pretty well uh, enumerated here and there. So I was, uh, I felt, uh, I felt like I knew what I needed to know. Um, Greg, you were one of the folks who was, you know, we talk about things all the time in our Slack channels, in our meetings, in our, you know, we're always like, our whole group is kind of like around the water cooler, even when we're not in the office, because our job is is so much about sort of taking the temperature of what people are talking about. And Greg, in those conversations, you were one of the uh, folks who sort of raised some criticisms of how Oprah handled the interview. And I was wondering if you could just kind of talk about what your kind of what your view of it was. I I just felt that um, someone who would have pressed Megan a little more on her expectations of what she thought life would be like when she entered into this relationship and when she married Harry would have been a lot more illuminating than just sort of glossing over that and letting it go and and for her to say she never Googled Prince Harry or never really did that much research about what life would be in the royal family, I thought, you know, there was an opportunity there that Oprah uh, should have um, glommed on to, and she didn't. But on the other hand, to see the impact that this whole conversation had, um, gives it uh, more value than um, it was, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just fascinated by the continuing impact that it had. I mean, I think that that gets to the kind of question of the place of TV and the culture right now. I often say when I am like going around town to talk to, you know, networks or um, agencies when I meet with their publicists, that the thing that I love about covering television is that when you cover television, you cover everything. So in the past 12 months, we've covered everything from what should you stream during lockdown to what happened during the convention tonight to, um, to the inauguration, uh, breaking sort of television news. We covered how local and cable news were covering the protests last summer. We've done WandaVision. We did the Royals. We did television is kind of our lens on the world, never more so than since we've all mostly been at home. And I, um, I wonder if, has the past 12 months changed any of your sort of core views about sort of where television is and why it matters or maybe reinforced them? Um, Tracy, I'd be curious for you to start us off because you joined our team during the course of the pandemic um, and started sitting in on our meetings, even though you had done sort of TV stories before then, has your view of television and its place in the culture changed at all? I wouldn't say it it changed. I guess it's, it, rein, it sort of reinforced what I had thought already, um, as you mentioned. Like, if I wasn't interested in television, I wouldn't try to cover it, but it it is, there are so many, it reflects us now and it reflects us a few months ago because that's how long it takes to, for TV to be changed. And it's, it's the widest reaching place of form of entertainment that people can talk about and people have access to. And that's how we, what we see on TV reflects how we understand the world and how we understand ourselves. And I think in a place where all we have is TV during the pandemic, pretty much. Like if, if you live alone and you're locked down and you're alone, like your interaction is all via screen, basically. <laughs> um, so it was it was a it was an interesting time to to focus and to really think about like like why are these why do I like the TV shows that I like and why are they important now, especially in a time where like you know, you, you can easily say, like, it's just TV, like, the world is in disarray, like, this is just TV. <laughs> um, but so for me, it reinforced, like, no, like, the world is crazy, and that's why we need TV to help us understand it sometimes. 
um, when I started writing about television, it was uh, back in the 20th century. It was it was marginal and not cool. Uh, there was nothing streaming. Uh, cable had just really started. Premium cable had just really started to produce shows of their own. Um, and I liked it as a subject, partly because of that and partly because it wasn't cool. You could write about it in almost any way you wanted to. Um, and now, of course, uh, it's the cooler. It's the coolest thing. I think I wrote a piece once about uh, how it was kind of like the new the new rock and roll. It was like kids were actually growing up wanting to be TV critics. The only people that were TV critics when I started were ex-music critics um, and myself. And there's still a lot. It's a it's still a group. But um, it's obviously uh, it's obviously the center of everything. It felt then, and it still feels like of all the things that you could be writing about as a critic, the best field to play in because there's so much that goes on there in so many forms. And even as a music ex music critic, there's music there. Lorraine just wrote about it in the, her Grammy review, so it's like you don't even have to give that up. But there's no other form that covers so much of the world in so many ways, uh, documentary, semi-documentary, semi-fictional, fictional, comedic, dramatic, um, anything you can imagine happens. And from high to low, from, you know, the, the silliest stuff, which, which a lot of, you know, which has almost kind of an intellectual heft to it by, by virtue of being silly and being everywhere to things that are really, really ambitious. And uh, I think it's um, I think it's proper that it's at the center of things. And yeah, I um, I have to say, like, you know, because I came up as a music critic, and you know, I love music, I do, and it's, but I felt like it was getting kind of narrow for me, and getting into TV. I can't imagine ever not finding something to write about or ever getting bored with this. Um, it's so much more immediate than film, obviously. Um, and it's just like, especially now, I just feel like there's so much creativity and experimentation. I mean, like Bojack Horseman, How To with John Wilson, Never Have I Ever, Dickinson, all these things we were talking about live in the same universe with the impeachment trials, with the election, um, with Harry and Meghan, all of this lives together. And it's like, you know, nothing exists in a vacuum. It's all kind of bleeding into each other in a way. And I love that because like the world is a messy place and television like gives it to you all and it's boundless. Um, I, you know, I can't, I'm, thrilled as a critic to be in television now because I cannot think of any place else I'd rather be. And it's in real time, more or less. I mean, you know, it reacts, it reacts quickly to the world rather than, you know, taking a year to come out to be in theaters. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I just, I just wrote a piece, uh, which I rarely do, but I wrote a piece because I think I'm the only person on, on the team who had the bandwidth to, to do this and also has watched every episode of Grey's Anatomy, of which there are um, more than 350 at this point. But Grey's Anatomy this season has been doing one of the best COVID-19 uh, storylines on TV. And its heroine has been essentially hospitalized with COVID-19 for three quarters of the season. And I wouldn't want every show to be about covid but only TV has the kind of fleet footedness to turn on a dime and say, you know what? We've been in the off season since then the pandemic started and we're going to write our new season around it. And I love that about it because it makes it, you know, as you all were saying, it's never not relevant because everyone is always watching something on TV. Yeah, I mean, and look how quickly late night pivoted. Look, I mean, just look how fast that happened. 
overnight. We don't have an audience. Okay. We're doing it from our living room. I mean, amazing. Right. And as we've talked about, you know, Robert wrote a piece at the time about how some of the best late night that had happened in a while happened because of the innovations required by the pandemic. Um, I think we all have talked in our sort of team meetings about the, the virtual Emmys and the sort of pandemic safe Grammys were two of the best versions of those award shows in recent memory because of that kind of constraint and having to be creative around it. And that's, that's just so exciting. Um, I, uh, I don't know if we lost Greg, um, Greg, but back. Greg, oh, there you are. are you there, Greg? Good. Yeah. I'm here. I'm just um, trying to all scenery changes. I thought it was something I said about Oprah and you're just like, I'm done. Boom. <laughs> I get kicked out of my own house sometimes, so I have to fight that. <laughs> Greg has a long um, history in, to, you know, he's a, he and I are the, we remember TV before streaming. But it was just uh, five channels and HBO was the only cable network. And, you know, it was, it was easy to, to keep track of it. And now Netflix premieres a show every 20 minutes or so. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a whole different world. It's, um, that's the, the last thing on our agenda before we go to some uh, Q&A is the life of a TV journalist, which I kind of came up in a world of the golden age of television, peak TV. My past experience was at a website, not a newspaper or a sort of traditional print magazine. So I think it really depends on what your role is and kind of what your experience is. But, um, you know, in terms of our workflow now, I think what we all talk about the most is that the sheer volume of television is the hardest thing for us to juggle. It isn't ever a question of, you know, is there something to write about? There's actually always about 22,000 things <laughs> that we could be writing about that we're not writing about because there are only seven of us. Uh, um, there are only, I guess, uh, you know, there's only seven of you and one of me. And, um, and so the last question that I have is for everyone to just kind of quickly round robin, um, you know, what was your route to your job and what is your typical day like? Um, Robert, why don't you kick us off and then I'll just sort of go around the horn. Uh, well, the route to the job was, I think, like a lot of people that do this job, uh, somewhat accidental. Um, it just happened that the LA Weekly needed a new TV critic, and I was friends with some people that were editing then. I'd worked, I'd been a, a music critic and a, and a music editor there in the 80s. And then uh, in the mid 90s, uh, I was at a party with a couple of people I knew that were editing there, and they just needed somebody. And they said, Oh, would you be interested? And that's how, and I thought about it, and I grew up watching a lot of television. I, Television was really important to me as a kid. It was ridiculously important to me as a kid. Um, uh, but I hadn't necessarily been watching it since then. Like, I ate a lot of hamburgers before I hit 21, and then not so many. Um, and so I said, I thought about it. I said, yeah, that does sound like something I'd be interested in writing about. And it turned out to be a really great, a great subject. And then uh, the Times, I kind of, it's a long story, but I kind of backed into the Times in a strange way. Um, and uh, my typical day is uh, uh, runs very late into the early mornings, uh, hours in the morning, um, and is mostly spent watching and thinking about and writing about television. Um, Greg, how did you start covering television? Um, and what's your typical day like? I was a news reporter uh, wanting to get into entertainment. And so I just started freelancing for the Times calendar section in between 
covering city council meetings in Burbank. And one day they, they took pity on me and Calendar hired me as a TV writer. Typical day is, uh, there are no typical days. Uh, it depends on, on what I'm covering and, and whether it's watching something or, or interviewing someone like, you know, going on a set except we don't go on sets anymore but but every day is different and I think it's the variety of that that I really enjoy about covering television because no day is exactly the same um and it's it it remains fascinating for me like that Tracy um I found myself in journalism after having burnt out not knowing what to do with my life, um, because I thought I wanted to be a lawyer, but I didn't. <laughs> um, so while I was working a bunch of random part-time jobs and taking graduate school classes, um, I had a friend who was leaving um, the Times. She used to be an editorial assistant, and she asked if I would be interested, because I was, as everyone around my age range, like, we're always looking for jobs. Um, so I started as a part-time editorial assistant at the Times, which meant I delivered people's mail and I pushed carts of newspapers around and dropped them off at different corners of the newsroom. Um, and I worked my way into sort of um, editorial coverage. So like I helped out, like I was like a fact checker for the travel section. Um, I learned how to work the website and I was a digital editor. Like I seemed like I picked the photos that went on the stories before everyone had to do that themselves. For people that did that for you. Um, and once, you know, uh, I, that's how I found myself in calendar and entertainment. And since I was, sorry. We still yeah. have you. Am I still there? Sorry. Uh, yes. So something, something glitched. Okay. <laughs> um, but anyways, I just started, uh, started pitching stories and found myself being able to cover a lot of like, pop culture, nerdy stuff, like superhero shows and comic books. And here I am. Mm -hmm. after, the, after the Disney event where they announced <laughs> all of their upcoming content, I, I joked that Tracy is the television editor now and I'm just her deputy. <laughs> because Tracy, your expertise has become so much more important in the TV space over the last five to 10 years, and it is only going to continue to become more important. And it's just like, you're, you've been an invaluable addition to the team. So we've been really lucky to have you. Thank you. It's very interesting to be able to tell your parents all the cartoons and comic books that they thought wouldn't get you anywhere and actually <laughs> can help you with your job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's good. It's um, good that we have, have a, you know, we have somebody that just naturally loves you know, loves a portion of what's out there and wants, you know, that's what makes it the coverage rich. It's like real affection for what we write about. Yeah, totally. We all come from different angles. Um, and I, I, as I said, I'm native Angelino. I grew up in the Valley, um, really immersed in pop culture, largely music. And that's kind of how I came into writing as a music critic. Um, you know, LA Weekly, Freelancing LA Times, Rolling Stone. And then um, I was music critic at Newsweek. I moved to New York for that. When I came back, um, the LA Times was looking for a music editor. I came in as a music editor. And then, um, then I just kind of started being a general culture writer and just writing a ton about culture. And when they asked me if I wanted to be a TV critic, I was like, well, I'm really like not you know, I'm not immersed in the industry of TV. I know a lot about culture and I write about culture, you know, largely. And it's like, yes, this is why you should be writing about TV. So that's when I started. And I, I guess I've been a TV critic now for four years. I might be wrong, three years. I, you know what? I started, my first thing was Trump's inauguration. So let's just, let's just set that in. Um, so yeah, and you know, what is my average day like? There is, as somebody said, I think it was Greg or somebody just said, we don't have an average day. We don't. It's just like, 
you know, sometimes I'm in my pajamas for like two days, other times, you know, just solid watching. Um, but the one constant is that it usually involves holding ice cream. Doesn't matter what time of day it is. It's ice cream and a screen. That is my day. Um, I don't know if you all know this story. You might because you were all here before I was. Um, I got my job because Meredith Blake, our reporter based in New York, and Mary McNamara, who is um, now a Times columnist, used to be the Times television critic, and for a period was the managing editor for entertainment, had lunch in New York when there was a, um, a search going for the job. And Meredith followed me on Twitter and I guess thought that what I was doing at Paste was interesting. Um, and so uh, Mary took that to heart and DM'd me on Twitter and said, uh, I've been looking at your stuff. I like it. You should apply for this job. Um, and that was the beginning of, you know, the, I went through the whole kind of application process, but, uh, I, it, it, uh, it was, it justified all of the hours that I have wasted on Twitter over the years, uh, you know, just chiming in with an opinion about everything in TV that someone noticed me through that and, uh, got me this, um, kind of crazy job. I, I, I probably have the most routinized day of all of you because I have to be organized enough for all of us together. Um, so I'm the one who has the sort of set meeting times and the color-coded calendar and the um, overflowing inbox and the the kind of like day-to-day. -day. But I do, I joke that my day starts, I sign on and then it's just sort of a cascade of different questions via Slack uh, until it's six o'clock and then it's time to go home and watch TV. So that's uh, that's my day. Um, uh, we, this has been such a great conversation, uh, but I definitely want to make sure that we do commit some time to answering uh, these viewer questions. Um, so I'd like uh, everyone to share any questions that they have after our talk. Um, I'm uh, sure we've already gotten some um, from our colleague, Sam Melbourne Weaver, who is gonna join us to share them. Hello everybody. Hey, yeah, we've got a couple great questions from our viewers. Um, if you're watching this, keep sending them in and we'll, and we'll chat about them. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for your for your insights so far. Uh, everyone's found it really insightful and picked up a couple shows to watch, so that's fantastic. Um, first question comes from Chris Schmidt, uh, who's watching on Zoom. He said, uh, can you talk about the lady in the Dale? I thought it was fascinating. Does anyone want to take that or shall I? I haven't seen it yet. You grab it, Matt, because we need Meredith here for that, but you should do it, Matt. So The Lady in the Dale is um, a docuseries that recently aired on HBO um, that focuses on Elizabeth Carmichael, who developed uh, a three-wheeled car called The Dale, and the purpose of the three-wheeled car was that it was lighter without four, four tires, and this was during the sort of oil crisis of the uh, the 70s when gas prices were high. Um, and what it reveals is that um, uh, Elizabeth Carmichael uh, was a trans woman and in some ways was kind of a trans pioneer, um, uh, a trans woman in business, but who also had a past as a con artist. Um, and in fact, sort of skipped town after her car company went south and was later sort of rediscovered through a segment on Unsolved Mysteries um, and then sent to prison. And I think what is sort of really brilliant about it is a couple different things. One is this sort of framing of Liz as an important moment in trans history of making it more than just sort of the heroic storyline, but talking about sort of a more complicated trans heroine. And then also there is 
a really beautiful approach to a lot of documentaries rely pretty heavily on talking head interviews to get through the kind of backstory. And sometimes that can feel very staid. Um, but the lady in the Dale has these really exquisite animations backing up some of the sort of description of Liz Carmichael's early life. Um, I highly, I highly recommend it. And uh, reporter Meredith Blake, who is based in New York and therefore it's a little too late for her to join us. Um, she wrote a really great feature about the series um, that you can find on our website and I encourage everyone to read it. Great, thank you. Um, our next question comes from Oscar Cosby. Uh, he says, can you talk about the binge model distribution of Netflix versus the weekly episode model of TV? Um, just wondering how that affects your viewing and your re reviewing um, and just how that's changed TV. Well, no, the, uh, go ahead, go on. No, 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 you go. You go. I insist uh, you go, Robert, really. <laughs> oh, okay. The, um, did you guys plan this? Was that a <laughs> setup? <laughs> we're a comedy team. We do this all the time. We were slack. Um, well, you know, that, that is a constant conversation now. You see a lot of articles coming out about it, uh, uh, because Disney's had success with, um, with WandaVision and uh, The Mandalorian bringing them out week by week. Now the question is, well, maybe this is the better way to do it because it creates this conversation that goes on. HBO is largely stuck to that. For a while, it seemed like the Netflix model was driving people toward to outlets that wouldn't necessarily release a lot of things, including, including uh, broadcast networks to release a lot of shows all at once. Um, I like the old fashioned way of week by week. Um, I do think that it creates, uh, it, it, it helps TV series exist in time, um, which, is a, which is something that television does. It's serial and, and it goes on and on and on. And the fact that you have a little bit of space between episodes puts them in, in the world that you live in because it's not as if every episode of a, of a television show happens 24 hours or exactly upon the heels of the second one. Um, and so I think sometimes with binge watching, even though it's, you know, binging is like, it's a bad habit binging. It's, except in television, it's, it's talked of as something that you shouldn't do. You shouldn't binge eat, you shouldn't binge drink. So if you're just swallowing all these things one by one, it can be, satisfying in the, in the moment, like, uh, you know, you're just pressing the button to get the, to get the drugs. Um, but, uh, I like, I like the longer, I like the, the long rollout. I think it's good. Yeah. And I, I think like there's arguments both ways, but I think the long rollout, the week by week, it does create like these kind of cultural touchstones that are kind of hard to find now because TV is so fragmented, right? So Something like WandaVision is a really good example. You're waiting for that next episode. People are weighing in. People are talking about it. Game of Thrones was that too. You know, like, I'm, and it's it, since we kind of got in the binge model in between, it was harder to find things that people were that were water cooler things that people were like really glomming onto and talking about together. On the flip side of that, though, what's interesting is that since you know, uh, a show like Modern Family that came out every week, just, uh, it's now available on Hulu, right? So my son's been binge watching it. And it's really interesting to watch something that wasn't supposed to be released as a binge watch and watching it as a binge watch. And it, it actually put a whole new light on that show. And I, I liked it more as a binge watch. So I don't know. I mean, there's arguments both ways, but, um, yeah, binging is never good, but then like the pandemic's been so hard. I don't know. I, I'm okay with binging lots of ice cream and TV. <laughs> Greg or Tracy, do either of you prefer binge watching to weekly viewing? I like small binges. So like, I don't like having to wait, but I also don't like, I don't have the stamina to watch eight hours of television um, for fun anymore. <laughs> So I like I like drops where like WandaVision give you two at the beginning. So like getting two. I think there are shows that sometimes give you three at the beginning. Like I like three episodes, the very consumable chunk where you're invested, you get to go in. Then you also, you know, it's a built-in break that you can talk about it. Cause I do think 
part of the the fun of television is being able to take a step back and like the discussions that can come from it. And when everything is dropped in one go, um, like the when I want to talk about a TV show, when I finally got to watch it, like everyone else watched it three months ago, which is so like they're they're done. <laughs> I like Tracy. I like small binges too. And um, sometimes people will binge a show and start talking about it and I haven't caught up on it yet. And then there's this pressure to get caught up on it. And then there's another show that's just starting. And so um, I'd like to go back to the regular model of week by week, but mm -hmm. that's just not going to happen. I oh God, um, that pressure of the question, you know, have you seen da da da? And it's like, oh God. Right. Don't ask Right. Yeah. It's just, yeah. Like, guilt is a large portion of this job, actually. Yes. Guilt. <laughs> I have to say, this is, I won't drone on because uh, this is like my, maybe my favorite topic, weirdly enough, is like I love talking about the model that sort of is emerging and where it's going, but people who really want to talk about it can like tweet at me about it. Um, I will say that my approach as an editor is very much shaped by whether something is weekly or it's a binge. Both work in different circumstances, and I, I think it actually really depends on what the show is. You know, your show has to be interesting enough to get people to come back week after week for a weekly model to work. A binge, you can sort of hook people just enough, and then, as Robert was talking about, have that kind of almost sort of like roller coaster kind of effect where like once you're on board, then you're, you know, then you're moving anyway. But regardless of which option is chosen by the networks and platforms, absolutely shapes how we cover it because it shapes how people watch it and how the conversation around it goes. And that that kind of determination is such a huge part of my job in the age of the internet is really thinking about when is the kind of wave around the show going to crest? Because we want to be there when the most people are looking for more material on a show. We don't want to be too early or too late. And that has a lot to do with um, weekly versus binge. I had a one thing tangential question. Go ahead, Tracy. Sorry. Oh, I was going to say, the one thing I do appreciate with the binge model is you always hit play on the first episode. So you know you're watching things in order where when things are dropped weekly, especially like on a network show and you can't, like you don't have DVR or whatever, like you, it's hard to get into a show like episode four. Um, so I think like getting, like that is the one perk I think of just streaming and stuff like that. Yeah, I was gonna ask just my own personal curiosity, what, how many streaming services are you guys subscribed to? It seems like there's a new one every week. Like, what are you, <laughs> what are you guys taking in? And what do you recommend for like a normal non-professional TV critic? If you had to pick like two. And two streaming services for, yeah. um, for a normal person, not a TV critic. I think that's how you should just put it for a normal person, <laughs> not a TV <laughs> reporter or critic. Yeah, um, I'm having the hard time even counting point. which ones I'm subscribed to. <laughs> um, Netflix. Definitely Netflix. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Uh, gosh, you guys, that's tricky. I mean, you know, the second the second one really depends on you. They're so they're so niche. So many of them, you know. I mean, there's Big Fox and Acorn, which are anglophiliac, and then there's uh, you know disney for if you you know gets you a lot of disney movies and some marvel and hbo max gets you um you know uh no do your ghibli films along with you know hbo and it's it's you, the second the second one is really a uh that's your kind of um that's your free choice yeah the one if you that want I... to see small acts which is great then you've got to do amazon prime I and the one that I tend to, the one that I tend to recommend to people who are like me, who I often don't have time to actually watch sort of broadcast TV the night that it airs. And so far, the best 
streaming service for me for like catching up the next day or over the weekend when I actually have a block of time to watch is Hulu. Um, and I, I think that Hulu has sort of the best catalog of, of broadcasting cable shows where they actually drop each new episode out after it airs rather than all at once at the end of the season. And that is helpful to me, but that's, again, that's a, that's, you know, a, a particular kind of brand profile that they have. It really does depend on what your tastes are. And they have some good original shows as well. Yes. Rami. And like, I watch a lot of animation and like Hugo has a giant library of like a, adult animation shows. All right. Well, I'm still curious about how many. <laughs> oh. How many? Like, oh you can God. count and get back to us. <laughs> oh, how many? Tweet that um, tomorrow. And we'll really, <laughs> how many are there? I have like At eight, least I believe, and that <laughs> I have eight plus a live TV streaming service, and that isn't even including any like niche ones that are, you know, like BritBox or Acorn. I'm just just covering all the kind of majors, I think is eight. Plus live then, TV. Like AMC Plus, that's the thing, right? I mean, who does that? Yeah. But it's a thing. Well, I'm impressed. I'm making my blood pressure go up now. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. You're all in. Right, that's the best one. That's got a lot of fans. If you want to see, if, well, one thing, if you want to see um, Dickinson, you got to get Apple Plus, Apple TV Plus. That's where Dickinson is. And um, Little America and Morning Show. Yeah. And Morning Show. How many? All right. I think we've got just one last question. This is from Adrian, who is who's 26. Um, and he says, during the pandemic, I found myself wanting to fill in some of my TV blind spots. What are some of the pre-2000 shows that you would recommend to someone trying to understand TV's development as a format? Um, I would suggest the Larry Sanders show, uh, which was on HBO in the 90s and uh, was uh, really the first show, the first HBO show before The Sopranos to really indicate that uh, that something different can happen on television. It was something with a different uh, sound and a different mood and, um, and an anti-hero hero. Um, uh, and I would... I would say that that's a Gary Shandling's the Larry Sanders show. Plus, it's about television. Come on, Great. Greg. That's you, Greg. Lorraine and, and Tracy was... don't remember before 2000. So I they... do. <laughs> <laughs> I would say All in the Family is a seminal show that, that doesn't, uh, I think, has even more relevance now uh but i would say that would that would be my go-to um uh, mine is oh no go ahead lorraine if you No, you go i don't know yeah you go um i think it was raised in my mind because um yvette cotto uh passed away um but if you want to know how we got to the place of sort of the Sopranos and the Wire and Mad Men and Breaking Bad, you will have to seek out, and it's not very readily available, but Homicide Life on the Street, the early 90s um, sort of police procedural that I think is really has the DNA of what we know as the sort of golden age TV drama is in Homicide, um, which has some really... I mean, that was something where when I was in film school at USC, it was one of the few TV shows that I remember having screened for us as being yeah. kind of like equivalent, equivalently artistic as a medium. Obviously, that conversation has really changed since then. But I, I love Homicide, and I wish it were sort of more readily available. And Andre Brower, that's where we first got to, got to look right. at him. You know... I'm going to go way back here and I'm going to say um, I love Lucy because A, Lucy O'Ball, brilliant comedian, female. The show was like based around her and she's still damn funny when you watch that. But also they were an interracial couple and my parents were an interracial couple. 
and my dad was from different country and Ricky was from different country and they made jokes about it. And it was so in a way before it's time. And it feels like somewhere in between things got dragged backwards, but we loved Lucy and Ricky together, you know? And like, there's something about that that was like, it had to be breakthrough at the time, but it didn't feel breakthrough. It just felt natural. Like that, that's the way it was supposed to be. I think well, those are some great. My pick is. Oh, go ahead. Drink, well, I was gonna say, like sorry. my pick is my pick is the show that's still on now. I think like if you go back and watch The Simpsons from the very beginning, like you get such a good reflection of what the world and television and like families were back then, and like just the cycle of all that. Brilliant! Totally. Yes. Yeah. I have to say, y'all, if if we did that as a syllabus, we would we would nail TV history. It's like a good <laughs> starter pack. Yeah, those are some great recommendations. I'm going to toss it back to you, Matt. Thank you guys so much. Thanks so much, Sam. Um, I really want to thank everyone out there for joining us this evening. Um, this was a really fun conversation, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as we do. Um, you can find all of us on Twitter and, of course, in the Los Angeles Times Entertainment section. Thank you for joining our We Can Teach You That series. We'll be sending you a survey, and I invite you to share your thoughts on this class, whether you'd be interested in follow-up discussions about entertainment and what other expert classes you might uh, be interested in in the future. Um, thank you, Lorraine, Robert, Tracy, Greg, and Sam. Uh, I'm Matt Brennan. I'm the television editor of the LA Times. Thank you for joining us. Have a good night.